This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Fetacy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Fetacy.com. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Be sure to check out my weekly podcast, You're Welcome with Michael Malice, now on Podcast One. You might know me from my terrible Twitter, my horrible books, or the nonsense I spout on podcasts like Rogan and Glenn Beck. It's all there. Are you black pilled or white pilled for the future of the UK? What is a man? <laughs> what is a man? What is a no? I, what is the, I, are you white pilled or black pilled? No seriousness, girl. No, 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 I love the Jesse Lee piece of question. <laughs> the fact that you discovered that gives me hope for some of the things that I've still got but, that are well, missing. Well, if you need James G. Blaine's autograph, you are welcome to it. Of course, being the co-author of How to Have Impossible Conversations makes you the perfect guest for this train wreck of a show. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> new episodes are available every Thursday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, and wherever you get your podcasts. You are welcome. This week, we're digging into the vault in honor of the Twitter files and re-releasing the interview I did with Matt Taibbi. Matt is an award-winning investigative reporter and one of America's more recognizable literary voices. He is best known for his work at Rolling Stone, where he won the National Magazine Award for Commentary and for his work on Substack, which he joined after winning the 2020 Izzy Award for Independent Journalism. He has written nine books, including four New York Times bestsellers, The Great Derangement, Griftopia, The Divide, and Insane Clown President, also receiving critical acclaim Where I Can't Breathe and Hate, Inc. And if you haven't read Hate, Inc., I strongly recommend it. Matt is one of my favorite commentators on media, journalism, and just really a brilliant mind and funny guy. I hope you enjoy. I'm with Matt Taibbi, everybody. Welcome to Watkins. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. You are me too. You're me on too. my top list of people. You, ha- you had this piece. I reread it again recently. It came out in, I can't remember the year, it was in Rolling Stone, and it was about how there was never a referendum on globalization. It was so instructive for me who was when I was in London, I think it was before this piece even came out. Everyone was asking me, what do you think about Brexit? And do you think Trump's going to win? It was right after Brexit. And I was like, yeah, I think Trump's going to win. <laughs> like, right. What happened here? Wow. Um, well, you were smarter than I was. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just was my whole theory was Kim Kardashian made seventy five million dollars last year. Trump will be president. I was just right. Like, Culturally, this is where our values are. But then, see, I was obsessed with Brexit because it did feel very canary in the coal mine. Sure. Of what was going on. And I didn't know how to articulate it at all because it's not really my wheelhouse. And that piece to me was so eye opening about what happened in terms of I was like, it's true. There was just this globalization happened. Everyone woke up. And like you said in the piece, suddenly their jobs were outsourced to 14 year olds in other countries. Right. Yeah. And they didn't they didn't really have coherent choices or ways to vote against that. You know, there there were some candidates who came along beforehand who kind of ineffectively talked about that stuff. You know, Dennis Kucinich was anti NAFTA uh, once upon a time. Ron Paul maybe amped it up a little bit more. But Trump, Trump was like the first person. He was a very canny politician. I mean, they just didn't Mm -hmm. give him credit for that. He he was you know, covering him because I, I was out on the road for Rolling Stone at his events. Yeah, he was like a comedian. He was sort of yeah. reading the room constantly and sort of feeling what people were hot about. And he would just sort of give them what they wanted. And you could tell there was just a lot of 
a lot of rage and frustration out there about certain things. And he, he hit those themes. It was, it, there was no mystery to it, but they, they kept trying to make it into a more complicated story than it was. So yeah, that was really strange. That whole, that whole yeah, thing. Yeah. I read a lot of your pieces. I felt like you were really one of the people who I trusted, who is accurately talking about this stuff, because as someone who is in comedy, I was like, this guy's hilarious. But then I would see the way they would take something that was clearly a hyperbolic joke, which granted the discussion about whether someone who's running for president should be making those kinds of jokes is another one. But the, he didn't. I don't know. It just some of the things got so blown out that seemed so um, oh, yeah. clearly tongue in cheek or clearly a joke or clearly like the audience got it. And then it oh. was like <laughs> not. I mean, not the. the way it was the the Russia, if you're listening, you know, can you send send Hillary? Like, please, like get people people took that seriously. They were talking <laughs> about launching an investigation. Like, yeah, and, and the funny thing about it was at the beginning of his campaign, you know, his campaign was basically like an Andy Kaufman routine. He 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 was he was sort of running like a parody political campaign yeah. where he he, he he was sort of accidentally on purpose saying things that you weren't supposed to say uh and the, the reporters didn't get it like they they were horrified you know he, he would he would use language like torture when he when a normal politician would say enhanced interrogation right. and <laughs> and and you know to them that was like this offense against dignity but but it was it was brilliant you know in, in a lot of ways and i'm not yeah. saying i approve of it but but i i definitely understood why people were reacting to it yeah you managed to weather that i feel pretty sanely i i i do think a lot of people's brains broke i think one of the side effects of trump was clearly just exposing everyone for who they really were. And then there were certain people. I think what happened, one of the people I one of the questions I asked guys like you or Glenn is, where do you get your news? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, on the on the campaign, <laughs> because I get mine from you guys. So I'm, yeah. I'm like, where do they get theirs? Yeah, um, that's just increasingly difficult, I have to say, like, especially with this new kind of quasi censorship regime where let's just say you search for something uh if you want to find out what donald trump said the first 15 results you're going to get is donald trump's words but surrounded by you know sort of mountains of contextualizing by other people yeah and so it's it's become like very difficult to get to the raw material about a lot of things because that's that's usually the the way you combat having to fight through you know, sort of media bias is just go straight to whatever the primary source is, you know, either congressional documents, if they're releasing things or video of what a speech was, but that's like harder and harder to do now. So yeah, in terms of sources, I, I listened, I try to listen to a variety of things and I always made it a point to at least be acquainted with what is being said on Fox and all these other yeah. channels, because that was another thing that happened during the Trump period was people just sort of stopped being in touch with what uh, conservatives were talking about. And that's one of the reasons they, they, um, they were surprised by Trump winning, you know, <laughs> like they just, yeah. they, they couldn't believe that there were people out there who liked the guy because they weren't following that news. So. Yeah. yeah. That they still can't believe it, by the way, even still, that's an idea that I keep pitching to everyone who's, I know you have a lot of time on your hands, but I keep begging somebody like the, I think the ground news people, too, I tried to get them to do it. I was like, someone needs to just start a site called Primary Sources mm -hmm. and whatever the like trending, you know, whatever the trending news stories are, you're like, OK, where's the actual video? Where's the actual document? Where's the actual study? My husband is like meticulous about his media literacy. So he'll read a headline, question how it whether it's affirming or or disproving his bias or whatever his reaction emotionally is to the headline. Then he'll look at the quotes. Then he'll go to the source material. Then he's like, let me see that study. Then it's like, who funded the study? Right. <laughs> no one has time for this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's you, how I, you kind of have to do it now. Yeah, ab absolutely. Especially since the news agencies have become more and more dishonest about that. Like they, 
they'll put in silent edits or they'll characterize something in a way that's 10% off what, what they're actually linking to. You know, the links degrade over time. People talk about, about this phenomenon of like link rot. You know, mm. you, you, you link to something and, uh, you know, 18 months later, it no longer is plugged into a story because it's disappeared. And, you know, uh, th- very often it's second or third hand interpretations of things that don't exactly say what they really meant mean to say. Or, or the, the story that was reported initially turned out to be wrong and it's still there. You know, I mean, I think that's that's a problem that we have a lot, like, for instance, the Russia story. Right. So you have a story that where the New York Times says Trump campaign had repeated contacts with Russian intelligence and the FBI comes out later and says, no, that's not true. But the story is still there. So it's it's a problem for people who are getting most of their information from links uh, because it's some of the corrections to the editor's notes have been staggering basically retracting the entire premise of the article (laughs) right yeah yeah (laughs) which there shouldn't even really be a premise of an article therein lies a huge problem it should just be reporting a fact but i feel how do we fix journalism at how do we do it uh well i think i think it's kind of on its way i'm like more optimistic about this than other people are because um you know, the, the, the tradition in the United States, we have a very kind of robust tradition of independent media, sort of new, new forms appearing. And I, I think what ultimately it ends up happening is that somebody discovers something that gets a lot of audience because people respond to it because they, you know, either feel it's true or it speaks to them in a certain way. And the old failed uh, method just falls away. You know, mm-hmm. the, the problem that we have now is that kind of the failure of the old traditional uh, news media and, you know, people like Glenn and I have talked about this a lot. It's compounded by the fact that it's now tied into Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. uh, And in some cases, the government is sort of artificial. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like they're, they're, they're propping this all up. So where there would normally be this organic process where some kind of alternative media would arise and displace uh, news media that people don't trust anymore, that's going to be harder to do now when, you know, the distribution is controlled by internet platforms that are really married to these, you know, the the ABC, CBS, NBC model. So, but I do think, you know, I mean, whether it's your show or Joe Rogan's show or, you know, Substack, Substack, you know, you, you, you see that there's this enormous audience out there that is frustrated and they're not, they're just not getting their news from the, the old sources anymore. So the the one thing that we don't have yet is a lot of kind of high level investigative journalism. Like we haven't found a way to pay for that. Right. But everything else, I think, you know, you can already see that audiences are, are already gathering around other stuff. Did you always want to be a journalist? Were you like one of those little kids that was super annoying and asked a million questions and spied on the adults? <laughs> you know, I so I, I grew up in a family of reporters. My father is a reporter. Okay. And um, so everybody I knew as a kid was a reporter. And wow. I never wanted to be a reporter, actually. Okay. I I wanted to be um I wanted to be a comic novelist. Mm. My my heroes when I were growing when I was growing up were all like funny writers like Evelyn Waugh and people like that. And that's what mm. I wanted to be. I wanted to be like a, a satirist. But it turns out that I suck at writing fiction. So when I <laughs> uh, when I graduated from college, the only thing I knew how to do was like the family business. So this is how I ended up doing this. Um, yeah, but now to- now I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you learn a lot of it just by osmosis being growing up around it? Yeah, totally. My, yeah. my father was, um, my father was a very sort of old school accomplished reporter. He had all these amazing techniques. Um, he had this thing he, he called the, the phone attack. So he would come home <laughs> from work every night. He would pour himself a high ball. He smoked uh camel unfiltered. So he would light one of those. And then he would just randomly flip through his Rolodex and call people at random. Um, and, you know, the idea there is that y- you don't call sources just when you want something. You have to be like in touch with their lives constantly and like constantly be hearing what's going on with people that you've met. 
so he would do that. He would spend hours uh, every night on the telephone. And, wow. and so I got a lot of education about how the, the job is about talking to people and listening and all this other stuff that was really great. I mean, he was, he was a great sort of role model for that stuff. Wow, that's amazing. That is so smart, too, because I think I just tweeted the other day. I was like, normalize ignoring people who only call you when they need something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there is that he he's into it. There does seem, and I was saying this to a friend the other day, too, just the level of psychology that goes into dealing with sources. That seems like a whole separate skill set from being a journalist, just having that kind of gut instinct for a story or where to go with one, but also knowing how to manage the people who will give you that story. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's a whole science to dealing with, with sources and kind of weighing which ones are more credible. Like, you know, when I first started covering the, the 2008 financial crash, I didn't know anything. I could barely balance my own checkbook. <laughs> so I, I started calling people at random and, you know, I think what you do at the at the beginning of trying to answer a question like what what caused the 2008 crash is you ask 20 or 30 people the same question mm -hmm. and you start to see which themes are repeated. Mm -hmm. Right. And you just get a sense for which people are believable and which people aren't. Every now and then, though, you'll you'll get a situation where maybe 15 people say one thing, but you get that one or two sort of dissenters who are just really convincing. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, that's, that's totally a feel thing. I think with, with sources, like you have to, you just have to be cognizant of, you know, it's, it's like, I think the police are the same way, right? Like you have to be, look for little cues about when people are lying or when they're saying things that doesn't sound like their own idea or they don't feel passionate about it. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the things I think that, that COVID has hurt because a lot of that stuff is in-person technique. And if you are only doing it by Zoom, I think you you miss a lot, you know, so. Yeah. And uh, just with the skyrocketing levels of paranoia, nobody, I like the phone or the text or even Zoom, this is the last place that I would be wanting to dish anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because people, people assume that everybody's listening to to every, and they're probably right, you know. I mean, if like, you're not assuming that, I envy you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't, That's... I don't think like the kids these days either. They are so, it's so interesting their concept of privacy. They just don't have one. They they assume everything, particularly because like my nephews, for instance, grew up around the later stages of social media. They're all teens now in early twenties. And they are so much more hyper aware of how everything that they say will be used against them. Everything is public. Nothing is nothing that you say is safe, really. Right. Don't you find it weird, though, that as, as aware of the, um, as they are of that, they don't they don't seem as upset about it no. as like people from, I don't know, my, I think I'm older than you, but from our generation, you know, like the idea of people listening to you, you know, for any reason, which is like so offensive. And and <laughs> now people are cool with it. They're, they're just fine. I don't know. It's strange. I think they just, some of it is the factor they, they call our generation. I was just talking to Antonio Garcia Martinez. Yeah, about mm. exactly this. Just how because we're all around the same age. You're a little bit older. I was I was I'm 42. And we were talking about how our generation is called. They call us like the skeptics, the generation mm -hmm. of skeptics, because we were the last people who were raised with out any of this. And the younger ones, they all had it in their hands. And so they're so much more immune to that information and all of it being public. And I think like my youngest nephew is like, I don't care if I get canceled, like bring it on. Be but he's like 12. Right. So they, because they have little mini cancellations. Now, what would happen to us in junior high in real life where you'd be ostracized and bullied and people would gang up on you? It just it, particularly with COVID and the kids, it's all happening virtually. Right. So they and now they 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 call it like being canceled. What we would just call, you know, being yeah right picked on yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> so they're a little bit more resistant to it but the thing with the privacy is weird 
and again, maybe they just didn't ever have it. So they didn't, you can't know you're losing something if you don't, if you never had it, which is, that's a little bit more creepy to me is that they don't seem to care. Yeah. And even people in young people in the media business don't care, which I, which is really weird to me. Like, you know, the, the censorship issue, uh, when I first started writing about that a few years ago, I expected that, you know, most of the people in the business would sort of agree with me that this is a bad thing. <laughs> and yeah. that wasn't true at all. Like it wasn't even close to true. <laughs> Why do you think that is? I think they they associate the increased surveillance and censorship with censorship of Trump or Alex Jones or people like that. And a lot of people sort of ideologically see that as a good thing. I had a lot of arguments with people in the business after the Alex Jones thing happened because I said, look, the issue isn't who it is. The issue is the how, right? right? Like it used to be that if they wanted to take you, you know, punish you for saying the wrong thing or, or publishing the wrong thing, they had to take you to court. They had to prove that you said something that was wrong or scandalous or, you know, libelous. Now it's just like, three executives behind a, you know, a door, you don't know who they are. They just turn you off and there's your career. It's over. Right. Um, and, you know, the consequences of that are like mind boggling for people in the media. This idea that we are now, you know, we basically live by the grace of the, these companies who, you know, we, we know that they're talking and consulting with groups like the Atlantic council or mm -hmm. Senate committees. So, you know, we're essentially dependent upon their goodwill, which is the opposite of how we want to be. Like the whole idea of the press is that we were supposed to be telling everybody, fuck you. And, you know, we don't have to listen to you and that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it, it's, it's weird. I, I, I don't really get it. I think, again, I think it's part of this new self-image that a lot of people in the media have, which is they see themselves as like the protectors of a status quo as opposed to a check on something. And right. um, yeah, there's, I, I, I don't know where that comes from, but that's, it's a thing. Yeah. That's really interesting. I get very nervous about all of it. Even the stuff you've been covering with Brett Weinstein, for example, why can't we have the conversation? It's that's, what's more unsettling to me. It seems like we should be able to talk about these things and at least discuss them I mean, I know a lot of supposedly heterodox thinkers and people, and they're all on board with silencing someone like Brett because he's like trafficking misinformation in quotes. Or that's what's worrisome to me is that you can't even ask these questions anymore. And I think you should uh, be able to. Yeah, it's it's totally counterintuitive. Like for for one thing, it's there's a total Streisand effect with this stuff. You know, if you don't want people to pay attention to ivermectin, the worst thing you can do is start bouncing people off the internet. It's un-American in the sense that we have always had an extremely high bar for barring speech, right? Like the the, le the legal standard is imminent incitement to unlawful action. You you have to be like essentially urging someone to violence in the moment, right? For right. for it to be outlawed. But they've they've pushed that standard you know, six or seven levels removed now. And they've created all these different categories of speech that, that are prohibited. I got a letter from somebody last week who had material that wasn't even public on YouTube deleted. It was like, you know, it was like some sort of, it was a draft of something that hadn't gone up yet. And YouTube went in and they gave him a strike for that. What? So, yeah. So there's, you know, it's, it's intense now. Like, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're even in the ballpark of a theme, that's not the right theme, you are really taking a huge risk now, yeah. and, which is crazy. I mean, I, like, I, I was very careful when I talked about the ivermectin stuff to not take a position on it, you know, yeah. just and try to stick to the speech angle. But I had people who didn't want to interview me about that or who would, who would say, let's, Let's do a, a take on this where we ask separately that question because we 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 haven't decided whether we're going to do that subject or not. <laughs> you know, just because they're uh, afraid they're going to like trigger the algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. 
We notice so. that a lot on Dumpster Fire when we one of the topics that we will talk a lot about is I'll just be screaming women basically at the top of my lungs <laughs> when they're talking about like birthing people or something like that. And oh, right. ever, whenever persons. we go towards that topic, we instantly get the, it's like we see it in the numbers. We just get throttled. We stop getting pushed by the algorithm. We stop. So it's not so obvious as like, we'll get a strike. We just see it. It's like, you can see the algorithm. I see it on Twitter too. You'll see when you're getting kind of like, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. You know? <laughs> <There's> no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's like a, it's an unofficial media regulator, basically. Yeah, it's so you know? psychotic. I have a very smart business advisor who basically was saying, you know, he walked us through like, you need to have plan B's for everything. So, and especially I think, I, I think actually the parlor thing, which was terrifying that all that stuff that happened around then to me, I was like, people were cheering. I'm like, this should not, this should be terrifying to you. And particularly journalists and stuff, because I, I guess it's just this unassailable belief that you will never end up on the wrong side of that algorithm or ideology or belief system. Well, what does that say about those people, though? Like, if you if you if you're so sure that you're never going to end up on the wrong side of the algorithm, that basically means that you don't have anything to say, you know. <laughs> like, and also, how how can you even know that if you in a time when everything changes on the daily, where the rules are just abs changing constantly about what you can't? It was like that joke where trigger warning needs a trigger warning now because trigger is triggering. Oh my God. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was a college that was saying we can't say trigger anymore. And I'm like, this is a, we're through the looking glass fully, but in, in a, in a society where it is that problematizing of everything to think that you're not going to end up on the wrong side of the algorithm seems very arrogant to me. I, I don't know why anyone would be that comfortable. Well, I think probably they're just not that bright. <laughs> I mean, I think it, 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 come, it comes down to that. I mean, I think the generation of uh, like reporters that I I knew growing up, I think they would have assumed they were they would have been first in line yeah, <laughs> for for this kind of thing. I mean, yeah. but the sort of new way of looking at at the job just sort of it assumes that all of this is benevolent, and I guess people who think another way are just not being you know, move through the system and promote it. I, that's the only thing I can think of because where's the person on the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post who's worrying about this stuff? They're, they aren't. No, you know? yeah. no, they're not at all. And that is terrifying to me. I don't know how, you know, I'm sure your inbox is even more insane than mine. Well, I know for a fact I'm, it must be. And I just get emails constantly from people about stuff that's happening at their work, stuff that's happening in community groups, stuff that's happening on next door, stuff that's a, stuff that's happening, just these little, I call them micro cancellations or these ways in which they're self-censoring or things they're not saying at work because they're afraid they're going to get fired. And I get, I mean, even when I put a call out, it's like thousands of emails from people with little examples of this. And now granted, they're all anecdotal, but at a certain point, I wonder what the backlash of that is. What are what are your thoughts on what that looks like? And I mean, obviously, you know, Trump seemed to be a, a reaction. And what's the reaction to large populations being told that their opinion is not only valid, but not even worth being heard? Yeah, I mean, I think we saw it with with Trump, but Trump didn't fully encapsulate what this is. You know, I, I think. The, the people that you're probably hearing from are probably all over the political spectrum. Right? Yeah, all yeah. over. I mean, anarchists, like they're all people who came from right to center, people who came from left to, to center. It just feels like there's a herd of people and they're being kind of corralled by these different forces that are pushing all of these unlikely bedfellows together. And hopefully we can unite and try and, you know, hold... I always joke like Joe Rogan is kind of single handedly like holding the Overton window open so it doesn't close. Oh, but. yeah. Well, I mean, look, look at the hostilities of Rogan's show. It's yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you if you you actually think about it again, Glenn has talked about this before, too. But 
politically, Joe Rogan's probably to the left of 80% of the country. You know, I think if you asked, if you just went down the line on all the issues, but you know, they, in the actual press and in, in the Twitter sphere, they were, they were trying to get Bernie Sanders to renounce his endorsement, I know. Uh, which is, which is to me an expression of insanity. It's like, a you know, you don't, you don't want that audience. Is that what you're telling Democrats is that you, you don't want to get new people coming into the party? Is that, is that the idea? And then be the idea that he, he's transgressive is, is nuts. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, and, and again, when, when they first went after Alex Jones, people were saying, oh, well, it, it's just Alex Jones. It's only going to be him. But then like very rapidly in the course of a couple of years, it just spread in all these weird directions. Now yeah. people want to, they, they want to obliterate all kinds of things. And you know, that's, it's just, it's, it's really dangerous. You know, you, you get letters from people who are talking about community groups. What I, what I hear mostly from are people in the journalism business who are talking about like, you know, stuff that's going on in newsrooms, you know, yeah. some, somebody wants to report on rising homicide rates and they're afraid to do it because there's a Slack chat in the office that is taking uh, a position on this that oh if you if you report on that then <laughs> you're you're essentially legitimizing some GOP narrative about something right w- well what if that's what if I'm what if I try to report it from some other way right like <laughs> and but then you get a reputation of being somebody who's difficult and in this environment you, like that's bad you, know, right. you, you could quickly find yourself without a job and there aren't that many jobs so there's this m- instinct to conformity that's you know kind of epidemic right now and the only solution is to have a job like yours or mine where you know you're not really dependent on anybody but even then you know we still have to worry about the the platforms so right it's a that, that's what i mean i don't worry as much as i worry in that if stripe is coming for me right things are already so bad that we're we're done cuz what i'm saying is not It's not that bad. I'm pretty much speaking like I'm a pretty average American and I'm speaking just a frustration with the insanity on all sides of the political spectrum. And the left, unfortunately, has a lot of low hanging fruit for someone like me. And it's just but it's I don't feel like I'm saying anything that outrageous. The things people say to me in my comments are far worse than anything I've ever said publicly. The, right. the names people call me and like the things they say, which is also the weird thing about these platforms is I'm somehow like a transphobe or something for saying women. And yet the stuff that people will say in response to that is utterly horrific, garbage and violent and abusive. Right. Well, and that's, that's what you were talking about. With the, the pass. <laughs> yeah. You know, this, uh, the idea that, what's forbidden or what's bad can change in, in a heartbeat. Like, you know, you could, you can easily go from, you know, what's transphobic today will be deemed misogynistic tomorrow or vice versa or whatever it is. And I think that's, that's a concern that people have to have. Like the, the way that kind of social media discourse works now, people end up taking really strong positions on things, but the kind of polls around which these debates swing, they, they change all the time, you know, right. the, mostly it's been political, but, you know, I think a lot, a lot of these cultural issues, you're going to see shifts where people who's, who were saying what they thought was an orthodoxy 10 minutes ago, are going to suddenly find themselves on the wrong side of everybody. And that's when I think people are going to start to notice how, how messed up this is. Yeah. Well, that's what I was saying to somebody recently who asked me how how can you reform someone who might be kind of captured by a lot of the whatever is in the water where people are kind of parroting a lot of the same like the you wrote about kind of the our long dinner with Robin D'Angelo, which right. is a great piece. So the people have been captured by that ideology. How do they generally wake up? And I'm like, there really is no way until the inevitably the mob will come for them because you can't be p- pure enough. And then they kind of wake up and say, oh, <laughs> like, right, y- there's something wrong with this. And, and you know, I lived in Russia for a long time and mm-hmm. they, they were, you know, one of the sort of 
classic stories about the Soviet experience was the person who got purged uh, and was interrogated by the KGB and then was in the gulag uh, and joined by the interrogator a few weeks later, right? <laughs> uh, like, I think that's that's a phenomenon that's starting to happen here in the States, obviously on a much less serious right. scale so far. But, you know, you, you have people who are part of the kind of torch mobs in, within organizations and companies, and they themselves find themselves under the gun fairly quickly. I mean, look at the kind of 17 magazine thing. There was, you know, they went after the editor and then the person who went after the editor got in trouble. And it, it's, it's just absurd. You know? Yeah, it does. I, I wonder, my ex-husband was Belarusian. And so we, and we're still friends. And, you know, he, I remember visiting him and I've told this story before, but it always cracks me up just right a couple, three years ago when I was home, there was something on the news. We were having, uh, just catching up and they were, I think they were covering something there was like a hammer and sickle flag and he was like bridging like do these people not know what this means you know he's like, he's like oh my what God. the hell is the matter with these people he was yeah. getting mad you know he's like i don't i was like i don't think they do know what it means and if they did they probably wouldn't be waving it around in portland <laughs> I, I actually had the same thing happen at one of the um one of the rallies there was a it was after charlottesville there was a rally in boston where they thought the next version of that was going to be in Boston. Right. And it was and like I, seven people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there were, there was a whole crowd of people there and they were, they were waving sort of old uh, hammer and sickle flags. And I, I asked one of them, like, do you, do you know a whole lot about the Soviet Union? I'm just sort of curious, you know, like, but no, I guess not. So it's, it's tough. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. If you haven't given it a listen, I s- strongly recommend The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know that every day someone tells you you just have to listen to some podcast and you nod and say, sure, and then you never listen to it. But don't let that happen here. Jordan's show has something for everyone. He talks to a hostage negotiator from the FBI who offers techniques on how to get people to like and trust you, which sound useful and disturbing at the same time. And in another episode, tells the story of a cinematographer who discovered a lost city in the jungle and made one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. He's had such notable guests like Ray Dalio, Kobe Bryant, and recently he spoke to Nick Bilton about hunting the dark web's Silk Road kingpin. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you know only one in three Americans believe we can fully exercise our free speech rights? That's why FIRE is stepping up to protect freedom of expression for all Americans, no matter where you're from or what you believe. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, or FIRE, knows free speech makes free people. FIRE's mission is to defend and sustain the individual rights of all Americans to free speech and free thought, the most essential qualities of liberty. FIRE educates Americans about the importance of these inalienable rights, promotes a culture of respect for these rights, and provides the means to preserve them. FIRE will always be a principled, nonpartisan, nonprofit defender of your rights. Join the fight for free speech at thefire.org. Why were you in Russia for so long? So a lot of my favorite writers were Russians. And okay. when I was when I was younger, I wanted to learn the language. You know, I was a lit student, so I okay. went there. I learned Russian. And then when after I graduated, rather than try to start a journalism career in America, I tried to use the one advantage I had, which is I spoke Russian. So I I started like sort of stringing from various parts of the former Soviet Union mm. and, uh, and ended up staying there for 10 years. I had my own newspaper in Moscow for a while and, wow. um, and worked, worked in both Moscow and Petersburg. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that, that experience definitely is a big part of a lot of my thinking on a lot of this stuff because sure. you know I, I I watched the the country went from almost total censorship about everything to a complete free for all back to total censorship in in the space of about eight years and wow. uh, you know I, I watched that process happen and you know I think people in America just don't have any sense of what it means to to lose uh, their ability to 
you know, to spoke, speak openly. They just don't have any experience with that. Yeah. So. Does that process, do you think, does it start first with the self-censorship? You know, is it is it a pro- slow process or, or is it, I guess it depends on if the government's just going to like shut everything down, but does it generally start individually? Well, look, obviously it's different over there because what was happening was, you know, people are getting shot for right disappeared. You know, yeah, they yeah. Seem, a lot of people get thrown off balconies. It seems like <laughs> yeah, the Russians are really into defenestration. That's like a yeah. thing with them. They they have they have like they have a lot of interesting traits as a people. One one of them is they they have a really unique pull towards exotic means of executing people. So yes. um, yeah, defenestrations, exploding briefcases, um, those things were uh, a big deal. Um, yeah, but. You know, what happens when there's an attempt to kind of chill speech and there's any kind of consequences, whether it's losing a job or, you know, over there being killed or beaten or whatever it was, um, you know, the first thing that happens is that people, they figure out where the line is and then they, mm. they stay way, way short of it. You know, we're seeing it in a different way here in the States, but, you know, definitely if you open up the, any mainstream newspaper, you can see that nobody wants to go anywhere near you know, certain hot button topics, right? They they just don't want to, they don't want to be the person who has to deal with answering the questions about that. So I think about this a lot. As open as I am and as as much as I try to push the envelope as I do, I still have to play within the game. And I wonder, do you feel like you're you found out where the line is and you're trying to stay within it too to a certain degree? Or do you I mean, aren't we all doing that just to survive? And isn't that also terrifying? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You've, even people who don't care about it, you know, I mean, I, I, and I know some people who really, really don't care about it, but you have to be cognizant of where it is. I mean, I, I, I try to be really careful about, you know, I, I try to be provocative on the one hand and unafraid, but also be really careful. It'll be to be factual and mm. all those, all those other things, you know, cause we're, now what happens is if you make a mistake going after one of the major meter me, media pieties, uh, you just won't hear the end of it. It'll be, it'll be the only thing that ever, people ever see when, you know, you're mentioned on social media or anything like that. So you, you have to be super careful talking about any of these things. It doesn't matter what the topic is. So it's, yeah, it's been a lot. I don't mean, I don't know how you know, you feel about this, but the, I think the last three or four years have been really trying for being in media. Like it's just a lot more, a lot more effort you have to expend thinking, thinking about other things than yeah. just making content. So, yeah, I think that that's what bothers me the most about it is that on my good days, I'm optimistic because I think I sense that people are just like, oh, over it in America and the pandemic in some regions accelerated that and in other regions, everybody really leaned into kind of the fear and, and just like obeying, which is also terrifying. And I don't really censor at all, like in dumpster fire at at all. And we will do an edit. And then there are things where we're like, "Eh." that's why we post the unedited version behind a paywall on locals. And I went to locals because, you know, Dave Rubin started it with as like a, basically because Patreon was booting people and I was on Patreon and most of my money was coming in there. And I was like, I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with this. I was not rich. I've made all my money. Like it was always hand to mouth. Having all of my money in one place was terrifying to me. That could just be shut down for no reason because I said something on someone else's YouTube show, not even my own. And so I moved over there and I actually know at least I'm like, at least I'll get a phone call. Right. And it's more empowering because it's Stripe. But like I was saying, if the financial institutions are coming for people like you or me, we're so far gone that it doesn't it's not we're done. You know, I think that that's true. Yeah. If if, if it reaches that point, there's there's really not a a whole lot of reason to even worry about it at that point. Yeah, exactly. If they're like coming for me, I'm like, well, we're screwed because I'm pretty milk to really what I'm saying is like talk to any most Americans anywhere, even like the younger kids, because I think they feel this weird pressure that they're under constantly, the teens. And I know a lot of the younger you know, Gen Z seems to be pushing back against a lot of this because they're reacting to the overly 
sensitive millennials. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be some pushback. Yeah, I think I I see it a lot with like my nephews and their friends and just the way they talk. They're like, dude, she was so triggered. Like they they're just they're (laughs) they're the kids will take anything and be like, you know, they're reacting to it and they listen. I, I'm always shocked at how many like 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds listen to Ben Shapiro like regularly. Wow. Yeah. Because amazing, he's, yeah. he's, there's not much for them. And Joe Rogan, you know, there isn't, right. where are these kids supposed to go? If they're only getting, you're a piece of shit all day long, every day, they're obviously going to seek out some alternative, like, you well, know, look, look at MSNBC's idea of what a youth oriented show was. They did <laughs> N- Nicole Wallace. That was their big ploy to get youth youth audiences was an ex Bush administration spokesperson <laughs> who like spends all of her time interviewing F- ex FBI people. Like they're totally out of touch with younger audiences. So yeah, of course they're, they're going to, but that's heartening that, there's a gen- there's a generation that's coming up behind you know the, the other one that thinks it's full of shit because that's the that's the only way that that this will get fixed i think i hope i mean there's a, there was a part of me that always knew that hollywood was kind of a vanity project just because so much crap gets made and i was like oh it just it, obviously people know people and it's you know some lawyer who has an idea for a movie and wants to get it made or whatever and then when it seemed like they just started shedding their audience in insane numbers. And I mean, even look at these networks that get less viewers than <laughs> like your podcast. Oh, I know. <laughs> and it does seem this terrifying thing to me, as I always joke, you know, capitalism always wins. I'm like, uh, this is this all just propaganda? Because if it is and they can just lose money on it. I don't I don't know how we get out of this cycle. I mean, Substack is really, you know, it gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting to be in uh, part of something in the media that uh, is not rapidly declining. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, because I, I worked in print for 30 years and that was the, the narrative of the, of the business the entire time I was in journalism was that we're losing, you know, like every year we, we lost market share, we lost money, we lost. We lost advertisers. You know, there was a uh, one of my editors at Rolling Stone used to call it managing the decline. But you know, when I moved to Substack, it, it was amazing to find that there was this massive audience out there that is willing to have a different relationship with the media than it used to. I, I think you know this idea that they're paying directly for something; they have they have some control over it and input. They like that. Mm-hmm. You know, the the old model. The audience didn't really matter. They were being talked at. Uh, an advertiser was paying a rich guy who was paying writers, and the audience only kind of vaguely figured into the whole thing. And you know, now they're intimately part of the experience. I think that's I think it matters a lot to them. This is a great segue. My one of your huge fans in my community, Curtis, asked a series of questions about Substack that I actually think are really interesting from sure. your perspective. And the first one he asks is, how will the Substack model evolve over time? That's a good question. So the 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 flaw in it up until now is that it didn't pay for sort of long form, in depth reporting. And even now, like someone like me who's doing well, you can't really take three weeks to work on a story the way I would have done. Like I would have taken two and a half, three months to work on a story a long time ago. Right. But I, I can't, I can't do that with Substack. You have to be cranking on content or else it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But what's going to happen is, um, and I think we're already starting to see this is that some of the people are starting to address that problem by they're making enough money that they're able to hire editors hire freelancers, Mm -hmm. do some of the quality control stuff like fact checking and then the next step is that I think there's going to be something like a, a, a Substack version of ProPublica where they put some seed money into doing like, you know, long form investigative stuff and mm-hmm. people will pay for that. I'm sure the money will be there for that. I, I, I guarantee it. So they've got the main problem solved, which is audience. So now we just got to do a little bit better with them on the quality front. Right. 
Yeah, it seems like everyone has to become their own individual newsroom, which seems hard, you know, that as an actual real journalist, I loved having an editor. I love having an editor. I'm not one of those people who hates editors. My great editors have made my work so much better. And with uh, even like my sub stack, I'm like, oh, God, this is just so raw. We'll treat <laughs> we'll treat it like a journal. <laughs> that's, that's right like a diary <laughs> like, because i don't have like somebody and i think that was one of his questions actually do you do you employ an editor somehow or have somebody kind of just look over your stuff and i don't not yet i have i have somebody who like looks it over for um like copy editing copy editing yeah. but uh but you know I, I i started in journalism well i didn't exactly start that way for a long time, I was I was I had my own newspaper, so I was my own editor for a long right. time. So I, I have some experience with this. Definitely, editors help, but for the moment, I'm enjoying not having one. That's so, good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I but, had um, I was so lucky. My first editor was so brilliant at Playboy, and he was just the best. And I would write. I was writing columns. And I begged them to let me write a weekly column. And then they brought me on and I did an online column for years. And my first editor there, he's like, no, you need to do this. I didn't fully. He's like, all great columnists are journalists. Because I'm like, I'm not a journalist. I don't need to like do any research or like, right. <laughs> you know, he's like, why don't we put a fact in or like, why don't you back this up with a source? I'm like, I don't need to do this. I'm just an opinion writer. And he was he definitely schooled me on, on in that department and made me just work so much harder and was so much better. But I didn't go to journalism school or anything. I dropped out of school because I wanted to be a writer. Right. Who, who was your editor there? Joe Donatelli. Oh, just so okay. brilliant. He was just so he did the society and culture stuff for a while and was just, you know, didn't give me he would ask questions like what wasn't really you know, I've some I've had some editors who have like rewritten the whole thing and put their own whenever someone starts putting their own thoughts into something instead of asking me to either present, you know, pushing me to really dig deeper. I had a great editor, Josh Schollmeyer, who went on to go start Mel Magazine, which now I think they're shut down for the moment until they find a new home or something. Every place I've written, it's like talk about dead links. He was another just brilliant editor, but he was at Playboy in Chicago mm. and just brilliant, just pushed me so hard to make my work better. And so I was so spoiled by Joe that I thought all editors were like that. Yeah. And well, that's I, great. When you find a when you find a good one, you gotta take advantage of it, definitely. I've learned they're not. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Watkins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com and join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. What do you think is going to happen with the subscriber bubble? Well, obviously, it's unsustainable for it to continually ascend. Um, yeah. You know, people people already complain that, you know, I, I can't subscribe to Nine substacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just does it doesn't work like that. But you know, on the other hand, you'd be surprised at how many people are willing to pay a significant amount of money. And people are also figuring out that even for free media, they're they're paying, you know. Right. Uh you know, you 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 pay in the form of increased costs for your products because that's you know, the advertising money gets figured into the price. So they're not actually get getting savings by switching from one to the other. But um, there are people who are coming up with a budget 
and saying, I'll spend X amount a year on media. And that yeah. number's that number is higher than I think a lot of people expect. Like, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people out there who will spend, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars a year on media sources. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I don't see why I also think it's important to empower people who you feel are speaking and saying the things you might not, you know, empowering those creators who might be taking those risks, walking right up to the line and might be disappeared <laughs> just because I do think there's some power in that. Having that financial backing obviously gives you a little bit more security, but also just it's harder to, I think, destroy you that way when you have it seems like a lot of you are doing really well in, in the Substack environment. What's the biggest downside for you that has in, in making that transition other than like uh, constantly having to feed the algorithm? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's the biggest thing because uh, again, I used to do stories where, um, you know, they would be like eight or 9,000 word pieces yeah. and I, I would interview a hundred people for a story. There's no way to do that now. And that's not just because of Substack. It's just because the, the news environment is so much more of a, a moving target than it used to be. Like, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but the New York Times did a um, did a, like a thirty six thousand word piece on Donald Trump's finances in I think it was two thousand seventeen. I think I remember this. It was just, it was massive. It was like the size of a book, right? Yeah. And you know, they put it out and they got lots of kudos for it because it was really like intensely reported. You know, I didn't think it was the most exquisite reading, but they, they put a ton of work into it. It was out of the news cycle in like eight hours, Yeah, you know? And on the other hand, you can tweet something and it will be in the news for a week. Yeah. So there's, there's this new calculus that people have to think about now, which is, do I really want to spend, you know, all this time on, on in-depth thing that isn't going to have the impact. So I don't know. I I haven't figured out how to sort of fix that problem because I, I do think at some sometimes you need to do in-depth reporting and carry people kind of a long way to explaining how things work. But that takes a lot of time and effort. I just haven't found what that is yet, like what that formula is. I don't I don't think people are going to read six thousand word articles anymore. I just don't think that's that's not going to be part of what people do. I know it's really weird because it seems like you're describing part of the problem with everything. You know, it's it's also the problem. It's accelerating that I think tribalism, it's accelerating. Like thank God we have podcasts because it seems like that's where a lot of these nuanced conversations are happening and people are going back and forth and they're having maybe not being fact checked in the way that you would that that's the benefit of, you know, some good reporting, but at least the, that conversation where you're hearing different sides is still happening in podcasts. And it's weird. People won't read a 3000, like a, a long 6,000 word article, like you said, but they'll listen to three hours of Rogan or three hours of you or, you know, they have the, and maybe that's just because they can keep it on in the background while they're doing multitasking and you can't right. do that when you're reading. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just a, a new way that people are consuming information. I haven't lost all hope that our attention spans are totally shattered, but I do worry with journalism in particular, you know, we seem to have a massive credibility crisis happening and in the absence of knowing where to go, I basically had to find specific journalists that I trust and I will and have differing opinions on things. And I can go and look at a topic and know that I'll get a reasonable sense of what what is happening now. Right. That is increasingly as people are having to chase the shiny thing, whether it's like a stupid tweet or something like Mr. Potato Head. And the more important things like, and this is something Antonio and I were talking about, like why that building fell down. You know, how did that happen in America that this just pancaked in Miami? What These are things that I feel like get lost and they're the more important things. Yeah. And part of that is because like, nuance is just disappearing anyway. So, right. you know, if you turn on MSNBC or CNN now, all you see are like, you know, those six talking heads and they're all agreeing with each other. So you have these monolithic blocks of opinion 
you know, if a story is complicated, people are confused by it. Like, right. I think that we're, we're raising audiences to be confused by things that are not uh, sort of monolithically one thing. So if you just to go back to my, my own experience, when I, when I was covering like, the, the 2008 crisis, uh, it was a hodgepodge of a lot of things. It was definitely there were people who took out, they bought houses they couldn't afford. That it's undeniably a part of the story, right? Yeah. They, but there were there was also this really really complicated scam involving sort of phony mortgage backed securities. There was also this sort of regulatory collapse angle to it. So, you know, the the Republican criticism of people who are being irresponsible. The democratic criticism of, you know, this is all the banks. It was it was a mixture of all those things. Right. Now you don't you can't do that because people have been trained to to either, you know, interpret the news in one direction or the other. And I think that takes away their ability to do an analysis like, well, why does that building fall down? It, it's probably the result of Many 15 things. different things right. and where everybody's guilty. Right. And and that's the kind of story that has trouble now. Yeah. People, people have trouble with that. I was, I was thinking about this, my friend, I was just in South Africa for my honeymoon in February and we were, Congratulations. thank you. And my friends who they, he started eco defense fund and it's one of these, they're over there and they're helping with the rhino poaching catastrophe. I was at a national park and we were, I was interviewing everybody and it was fascinating hearing from the guy who felt totally like this was pointless. The guys who, the vet, the guy who had been there forever, the old ranger who was like, you know, the poverty stricken poacher. And then the other guys like, whatever, fuck that. They all want money. And like, just how fruitless it feels because it's so easy to corrupt anyone who's in that environment. And the piece I wanted to write was the problem with the rhino is the problem with everything. It's the, it's the same problem we have with homelessness. It's the same problem we have with our banking and regulations. It's like, they're so complicated and it's so many different things that are influencing one another at the same time. And there is a sense of hopelessness because you, we don't have the structure right now to even have these conversations or start parsing these things or undoing these very complicated topics or even address them or the attention span, apparently, to learn about. Well, them. yeah, uh, p- people clearly, you know, you're going to stress out their ability to get the entire picture just by going through like two or three stories. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you ask people to try to understand central banking, that's probably already the maximum that most people are going to be able to, to get through, right? right? Like expecting to understand two topics or three or how Congress works or, you know, what, what the rules committee in the house does, or, you know, <laughs> uh, you know a- any of those things, there's no way to get somebody up to speed enough to understand all that stuff. So the only way you can do the news is to shorthand it. But the problem is all these problems, as you say, they're, they're in, it, incredibly complex. They they will not get solved unless it's by people who understand all those different angles. So there's there's this place, I think there's a tension where people are going to have to start realizing that, you know, there's a limit to how much I can know. Uh, I'm either going to have to, de- to defer to some people or I'm going to have to limit what I read about or limit my expectations. You know, all, the, all these things are difficult, but right. But the, the, the one thing that you can't do is lie to people and try to make them think that actually it is possible to understand all this just by taking a one simplistic take on everything, right. which is, which is what we do with the news. Now, right. you know, we, we, we rapid fire stuff at people. We tell them what their one acceptable opinion on a topic is. And, you know, we move them along to the next subject and, that's just the worst and stupidest way to handle this. Um, I know. I have some hope. I recently wrote a piece for Newsweek just about the Bill Cosby thing. And I was writing about how I basically my experience of sexual assault mirrors what his victims that went through. Hmm. And I've written about just a long time ago when it started breaking, how I was like, oh, wow, this is affecting me in a weird way. Now, seven years later, or whatever it is, from then I was looking at the information coming out and I was like, eh, 
I was very nuanced in this piece of like, well, yeah, as someone who's gone through this, it feels like a punch in the gut and it sucks because there was this feeling of like, oh, this is a win for all of us a little bit that never maybe got to confront our assault people. Assailants, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, assailants, assault people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a journalist. <laughs> I like that term, actually. <laughs> it's gender neutral. <laughs> so it's assailants, but that's fine. So I never got to have that. And then I was talking about how, but by the letter of the law, this was already baked into the cake. It was, it's what happens when you don't follow the letter of the law. And I, the number one email comment feedback that I got was like, thank God for nuance. Cause I was like, make being undecided about something great again, you know, wow. make, make ambivalence great again is, is going to be my platform. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I, I would have expected that you, you would have, you would have taken some heat for that, but that's good. That, that, that's, no, it that's was encouraging. overwhelming, overwhelming support and overwhelming thanking me for even people from the left who have like hated me, like family members and stuff. They were they were surprisingly supportive and and like, hey, I love that piece. So it gave me hope that there's still room for it. But again, I don't think people have a capacity to go past like 900 words. Right you now or 12, maybe 1200. <laughs> yeah. Just... Well, and then there's also this other other problem, which is that people can't separate out like the who from the what with stories like that. Like if you're of the opinion that Cosby is a bad guy, which I I think is probably the right opinion, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, we know that, but that's totally separate from the question of like what happens legally. And, you know, just, just because you might have respect for what, for the legal decision doesn't mean that you're a fan of Bill Cosby, but the way we've trained people in media now is if people see that you're, you're taking a certain position, they say, Oh, you're defending X, Y, or Z. You're right. defending, you're defending that person. Well, well no, you know, that's not what I'm saying, you know, like, but audiences don't have, I worry that they've lost the ability to kind of separate out the larger issues from, from the people. I mean, I get that. Your with audience the, you know. seems to be able to, I mean, yeah, your audience yeah. is big and you have, and Joe's audience is huge. And I, I, I'm confident that actually the majority of people, I wrote about this for my column for spectator this. And again, um, I hate when I have 900 words, it's print. So it's like an actual limit. And it's so hard yes. because, <laughs> because it's a real limit. And I I couldn't get everything I wanted to say in this piece. I was talking about how this woman asked me in very hushed tones at the Hollywood Bowl on the 4th of July if I was a Republican because I was wearing a USA headband and leggings that were the American flag. Oh and so God. it was crazy. And I mean, I'm in LA, so I get it. But she was like, I just don't see people of your age or young people expressing patriotism. So I was talking about how this binary in particular is so destructive because now it's this idea that everyone on the left hates America, which is not true. Most moderate, you know, liberals I know are very proud to be American or or love their country or understand that it's an extreme blessing to have been born here for many reasons or to immigrate here which a lot or of, to immigrate here yeah. yep so there's so many i think that there is a lot of again it's this thing that's become a like either or and i couldn't really get into the fact that the woman who turned her back at the you know like the ceremony at the olympics which is insane to me it's not even like it's a private organization or you know like a pre a just like a club team. It's like you're literally right. representing your country. Um, <laughs> what did you think you were representing? <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of a mixed message. Don't you think? Yeah, it's like, I'm going to turn my back on this flag that I'm literally representing right now. Um, it just that's a weird one to me. So I was like, she's just spoiled. And I know I'm going to get shit for it because I think fundamentally one of the beautiful things about America is that we can crap on our flag if we want. I mean, right. That's what makes America great. Yeah. And it, it is one of the best parts of it. But getting into that in a piece with 900 words where I'm just basically trying to say my my fear is that if you love America, you're considered right wing. Like right. that's going to drive people 
to the extreme left where they feel like they have to signal that they hate America, even if they don't, so that they're not perceived as right wing. That's right. terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing now, you know, this idea that if you have any of a certain number of opinions that you're enabling the right or you're somehow right wing, like maybe maybe not in the surface, but deep down inside, you, you know, you're you're helping the right or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I get that a lot. Uh, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> it definitely well it's enough to make people think twice i'm sure i'm sure there's tons of people who don't want to go through that so they'll they'll avoid that but that's funny yeah actual actual real word limits i forgot what those are yeah um, actual uh, real word limits i it's definitely i see a lot of the criticism you get it's very similar to the stuff i've been hearing at what point do you just say I don't know if you went through this maybe you didn't because you were really you've been in, actually i stumbled into this you actually were in this for a long time and it seems more intentional. Uh, but I definitely went through a point in like 2017, 2018, where everyone was like, you're just carrying water for Nazis. You're just carrying water for all these radicals. You're just carrying. And I really had to step back and ask myself, am I, you know, am I, right. and I don't even realize it. Am I, am I doing something like there it's I'm entirely I'm in recovery. I know I can lie to myself. I know that I have <laughs> massive blind spots. You know, these are things that I'm very well aware of. Am I actually doing what I'm being accused of doing? Yeah. Well, uh, I think you and I have some things in common on that score. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I, I, I know I have a total capacity to be full of it and self-deceiving and all those things. So, yeah, when the when the Trump year started, Especially with the the Russia story, I had I had a lot of thoughts of maybe I'm crazy, you know, mm -hmm. like or may, maybe I'm maybe I'm just completely seeing this the wrong way. Yeah, you because know, the the unanimity that I was getting from colleagues and people who I really respected was freaking me out. You know, right. I mean, like it it wasn't like mild objections; it was really intense. You're wrong, kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, but you know that's that's what this job is all about is you have to sort through those moments. And, you know, if it was easy all the time, then you wouldn't get, that wouldn't be terribly rewarding. So I, uh, yeah, I had, I had a lot of moments in 2017 and 2018 where I was worried, you know, I think as time went on, things become clearer. I mean, that's just the way life is. You right. sometimes when there are dramatic shifts and things, you, initially it's just hard to see the whole picture now now i you know after all this time and all the things that have happened on the censorship front on the kind of like intellectual restrictions and you know illiberalism all that stuff you know that wasn't as clear four years ago or three years ago now it's now it's obvious so i don't worry about it but yeah for sure i went through the same thing yeah I like to take stock of all the ways I'm wrong. And sometimes, I mean, we're always joking on Dumpster Fire because Dumpster Fire is like, it feels almost like we're writing the simulation, like we're in charge of it. We'll joke about something, then it will be like true three months later. But in many respects, I thought, like, I thought for sure Trump was going to win. I was shocked that he didn't. I was so wrong. Like these kind of extreme right wing pundits who are almost parodies of right wing pundits were like, you don't lock down. The government will never let go. And I was like, you guys are just being crazy. What are you talking about? This is America. And why was I wrong about that? <laughs> They're like, right. they take power and never give it back. And I was kind of like, what's the big deal? Two weeks. And I was so wrong about that. And I just feel like I think it's really hard with the news cycle moving as fast as it does. Everyone, like you said, the the toll it takes is um, you're kind of like growing up in public. <laughs> you're falling flat on your face in real time a lot. Or I am. Maybe not you. It's probably no, why I trust are. you as a yeah. journalist. Yeah. <laughs> and I just it would be much easier if the culture wasn't so unforgiving. You mm -hmm. know, there's a lack of kind of compassion in general, I think, for people, for mistakes, for people messing up or putting their foot in their mouth. In general, we're seeing this. And and yet it's weird. Some journalists are held to these impossible standards and some can just get shit wrong consistently all the time. Oh, never yeah. have to take it back and just keep on getting paid seven figures. 
I don't get uh, it. And promote and promoted continually <laughs> after, after like sort of the most monstrous screw ups. Um, Same in politics. Freaking Garcetti is in oh, India now. <laughs> My friend is like, well, he does know a lot about people living in poverty, <laughs> and, and, and and then like I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's That's just excellent. A, it's so crazy. Well, I I could talk to you forever because I just want to process the entire world with you, but I know you have to go. You're welcome back anytime. Anytime oh, you have thanks, anything thank you want. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Anytime you want to promote anything, anytime you want to process what the heck is going on, anytime. Uh, just Excellent. Reach out. And my audience loves you. I always ask the same two questions at the end. What is your biggest defect of character? Oh, um... You can take that however you want. It could be something. My biggest defective character, probably I'm just misanthropic and, uh, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you know, professionally, this is a job that is really, really favors people who really like people and like talking to people. And I don't. um, (laughs) And, uh, you know, like like all writers, probably way too self-involved. So Mm -hmm. those are bad things. But some some of it's been blunted by having kids, so that's yeah. that, that's a good thing. But uh, yeah, those are bad things. And uh, what's your? I'm biggest... sure there's worse, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think when I asked Antonio that question, he was like, "Um, where do I? Where, I have to pick for my list." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you, you go maniac. Like I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To, obsessive. Know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All these things. What's yeah. your biggest asset, though? Let's end on a high note. Um, that's, that's, that's tough too. I'm, I'm, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'd probably say that I'm honest, you know, I think as, as much, as much as you can be in this business, I've at least tried over the years not to be completely full of it. So that's, that's the one thing I'm probably, I guess I would be proud of, uh, but I don't know people could probably pick holes in that too, <laughs> if they, if they looked. So they can peg holes in anything. What did Glenn say? Did you ask him that? I did. Um, oh, what did he say? I can never remember what everyone says. It's like, I swear my brain is so forward focused that uh-huh. I have. It's like me with movies. I'll watch a movie and then I'll watch it again. And it's like, I never saw the movie. I just don't retain <laughs> any, any, like any kind of plot. It's just yeah. right through my brain. Yeah, uh, I would. Ha- I'll listen though. I- I'll have to remember what he said. I'll, ha- I'll have to go. I'll have to go check that out. Yeah, that was a fun episode too. We, we just yeah. like jive. I feel like yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, where can we find you and your Substack and all of all of the things? Um, I'm at taibi.substack.com uh, and uh, also usefulidiots.substack.com. So that's the podcast I do with Katie Hel- Helper. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's it now. I'm no, no longer officially at Rolling Stone, so not there anymore, but, um, but thanks so much for having me on. I really Thank appreciate you. it. And, uh, maybe we'll have you on a uh, useful idiot sometime. Oh, that you, would be maybe. awesome. I'm like the definition of a useful idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. There's no check-in this week. Enjoy the holidays. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)